Beyond the thriving economy, vibrant culture and advanced business infrastructure are millions of Hong Kong residents living below the poverty line. Ironically, the government pours over 3,000 tonnes of food into landfills rather than the stomachs of human beings. Therefore, those in the poorest cities depend on garbage for their daily nutrition. The real builders of this wealth remain in the periphery, while their paymasters take the glory for doing practically nothing. What is Hong Kong hiding from the rest of the world? After Hong Kong emerged top of the ranking of cities with the most billionaires, analysts were not shocked. Of the 114 billionaires, 26 get the bulk of their fortune from real estate. The city also has over 434,000 multimillionaires, which is projected to increase by 11% by 2030. This is not fantastic news for people in the lower class, because this level of success is not predicated on mere hard work. It's reserved for a certain group of people who do not work themselves to death, yet have enough for themselves and their families. How did the city get to this point of no return? It began with gradually impoverishing the masses before escalating into a full-blown deception. Here's how it all started. In the early days of Hong Kong's unrest, the political class blamed the uprising on the teaching of liberal studies. Societal dissatisfaction increased in 2019 and 2020 when residents flooded the streets to express their disgust at the city's imbalance and disproportionate concentration of wealth. Hong Kong has become more stratified, like most capitalist nations in recent years. By 2016, it was named the most inequitable metropolitan area in the world. Amid all that was happening, a certain social class remained unbothered. In fact, they became 44 times richer. Poverty became more localised in the 1980s, when the city transformed its economic structure from manufacturing into other non-manufacturing activities like finance and real estate. This switch was necessary due to the rise of industrial cities and states with similar economic structures. South Korea, Taiwan, Mexico, Brazil and Singapore emerged top in manufacturing and edged out Hong Kong. To rescue its economy, the city diversified into watches, electronics, toys, etc. So the textile industry phased out. Unfortunately, workers in the manufacturing industries lost their livelihoods since they were unskilled. Sooner than these workers realised, wealth gradually accumulated in the finance, insurance and real estate sectors. Despite being labour intensive, the labourers preferred their former jobs because they earned decent pay. Little or no intervention from the government is another reason for the widened gap between the rich and the poor. Since the government benefits from thriving businesses, it doesn't bother much about implementing certain policies. Over the years, various city leaders have promised to tackle poverty but it ends like every other empty promise. When former Hong Kong Secretary for Labour and Welfare Law, Shi Kuang, announced the government's plan to increase the minimum wage to 37 Hong Kong dollars and 50 cents, the residents were not impressed. They noted the intervention was little, considering the city's post-intervention Gini coefficient was 0.473 in 2016. Also, the government's low social welfare expenditure and low income tax hampered its ability to redistribute wealth. Here's the thing, Hong Kong residents expect a little from their government concerning bridging the gap between the rich and poor. Positive non-interventionism as an economic policy was signed into law in 1971. It states that it's damaging to the growth of an economy for the government to allocate resources available to the private sector and frustrate the operation of market forces. Note the key words in the policy economy and private sector. This suggests the city is built to enrich the private sector. According to a survey by JobsDB, a career portal, about 75% of the employees that work overtime in the office receive no compensation. The amount of extra time ranges from 4 hours to 16 hours. Aside from working overtime at the office, 61% of workers work during their personal time. Most workers who go the extra mile say they do not want to upset their boss or colleagues. It is literally taboo for a subordinate to leave the office while the boss is still working. Experts say unhealthy work culture, unfair employer-worker dynamics and inadequate legislation allows this unfair practice to thrive. Lawmakers concerned about the workforce ask the government to regard illnesses triggered by long working hours as occupational diseases covered by the ordinance. When they are young, they have to sacrifice their family, sacrifice their health, 
uh, you know, uh, their well-being, their freedom, and they have to work for uh, 12 hours, 14 hours a day, uh, six days a week. And then, when we are old, we don't have any retirement benefit. So it's a shame. They also demanded that employers compensate their staff if found guilty. Again, the government comes in defence of the private sector. The Secretary for Labour and Welfare Law, Shi Kuang, said there's no recognised criteria or medical evidence linking long working hours with certain physical, emotional or mental diseases. He blamed such illnesses on family or personal factors. Contrary to the government's claims, Data from the World Health Organization suggests that working long hours increases one's chance of dying from heart disease or stroke. The Hong Kong Poverty Situation Report of 2020 says 1.65 million people, constituting 23.6% of the city's population, live below the poverty line. That is, one in five Hong Kongers is poor. The worst hit are low-income families, the elderly and the unemployed. These groups struggle for basic needs like clothes, food and shelter. The city has no low-income assistance scheme to help the unemployed and is not working on any. Housing in this city is one of the worst in the world. How do an unprivileged class of people get a roof over their heads in this region owned and controlled by the affluent? Hong Kong's over 1.6 million poor residents are forced to grapple with increasing house prices. Home prices have soared by 165% in the last decade. The average monthly rent in Hong Kong for a one-bedroom apartment is 15,000 Hong Kong dollars, equivalent to $1,900. The city centre with more amenities is between 20,000 and 30,000, equivalent to 2,550 to 3,850. Only middle-income earners can afford this luxury. Expensive rent has forced over 200,000 people to settle for illegal accommodation, popularly called coffin or cage homes. These units are subdivided portions of a room and can barely fit a bed. Despite the discomfort and challenges associated with this kind of accommodation, the occupants do not mind. It is so bad that some residents live in windowless box rooms. They create holes themselves in the walls to allow air to pass through. Many residents suffer heat stroke and cramps due to terrible living conditions. 2009, this is the way that hundreds of people still live in Hong Kong. And those who are campaigning to eradicate these sorts of dwellings say they could be around for decades to come. In May 2022, public housing applicants reached 245,000 with an average wait time of 6.1 years. As the population grows, wait time also increases because the government is less enthusiastic than it claims to provide affordable homes for the poor. Further shortages suggest that wait times will increase in the future. In June 2022, China's cabinet-level office in charge of the city urged Hong Kong's leader John Lee to address the city's housing problems. China's President Xi Jinping also lent his voice to the call for more recent housing. Hong Kong's leader, John Lee, responded that his government plans to build 30,000 larger and cheaper transitional homes in the next five years. This promise is the third for the housing sector. The first housing plan was the 100 billion Hong Kong dollar Northern Metropolis project aimed at housing 2.5 million people. The second project, called Lantau Tomorrow, planned to use 624 billion Hong Kong dollars to create 1,700 hectares of land off Lantau Island. Both projects face environmental, technical and legal challenges, therefore are pending. So here's the deal. There's no chance in the world that the housing price will decrease in Hong Kong. The government pays lip service to the housing issue because it is the greatest beneficiary. The land that realtors develop is mostly controlled by the government, which leases them at outrageous rates. In 2022, two Chinese property barons paid a whopping $2.17 billion for a plot of residential land. This amount exceeds market valuations by nearly 50%. Because the city is tax-friendly, it generates revenue from other sources. One such way is selling lands at high prices to make up for its tax losses. Therefore, realtors rent these houses at jaw-dropping rates because they spend a fortune on land acquisition. With rental rates rising to unreachable heights, many have asked the government to implement rent control before things get out of hand. This policy sets a rent benchmark, so landlords do not increase prices randomly. Property investors argue that this would distort the economic incentives of investing in properties. 
the city has partly implemented the rent control law, preventing landlords from increasing rent within two years and not hiking it over 10% afterwards. Months after this law was passed, the Alliance monitoring the government's implementation of tenancy regulations of subdivided flat units reported that the authorities had only inspected 460 out of 120,000 subdivided flats in Hong Kong. Findings reveal that electricity and water charges are about the same as before the law was enacted. Some tenants say they even pay more. This goes to show how lax the government is in implementing its policies. Sadly, too, the city has unfriendly human rights laws targeted at the poor and vulnerable. Freedom is a luxury only the rich can afford, which further compounds the dilemma of the poor residents. Aside from deliberately impoverishing her citizens, this city does not welcome dissenting voices. Hong Kong used to be a hub of press freedom in Asia, but in 2022, it dropped to 148th, according to the Reports Without Borders annual index on press freedom. This figure drop is almost 70 places in one year. This drop is thanks to the national security legislation imposed in 2020. Within two years, Next Digital, Factwire, Mad Dog Daily, Citizen News and other media houses shut down because dozens of journalists were detained and their lives threatened. This clampdown resulted in the loss of over 1,000 media-related jobs. This security law allegedly clamps down on terrorism, subversion, secession and collaboration with foreign forces. Under this law, suspects can be taken to mainland China for trial in an unfair justice system. Those charged may not contact their families or lawyers. Worse still, they are tortured for months before anything is heard about them. During the 2015 lawyers crackdown, Li Helping was beaten and drugged while in secret detention. Hong Kongers are more confused because the security law is vague. Most have shut down their social media accounts for fear of violating the law. Amnesty International says the government uses this national security law to justify harassment, prosecution and arrests. Although Hong Kong blames Washington for the uprising in the city, this accusation might be a deliberate attempt to shift attention away from the core issues. What can Hong Kong do to be in the good books of the poor and middle class? Please tell us in the comment box below. Like and subscribe to Incredibler if you haven't because you don't want to miss the next episode.